So listen to this, Ronaldo is finished. Or at least that's what they have been saying for years. Even back in 2017, seven years ago, I heard it damn near every day. We were heading towards the 20th match day of the season and he was still stuck with only four league goals and strangely, the fans seemed to be praying for his downfall. Once he came back with 21 goals in 12 matches, completely demolishing all the claims, they were almost disappointed. It reminded me of something someone once said. The one thing they love more than a hero is to see a hero fail, fall, die trying. In spite of everything you've done for them, eventually they will hate you. Ronaldo has been a victim of this phenomenon over and over again, and 99% of the time, if you were just a bit smart about it and managed to keep a cool head, you could see that it wasn't the end. I mean, I never doubted him. Well, except once. Precisely one year ago today, for the first time in my life, I looked at my phone and thought, yeah, this is it, it's over. I almost feel bad saying that, but honestly, I feel like a lot of us have forgotten already how bad things got. It's no wonder I thought there was no coming back. This time around, it wasn't like they were just enjoying his downfall. They were actively trying to tear him down, to kill him off. It was a public character assassination. It made no sense. Except, it sort of did, because, remember, Ronaldo was never supposed to have come back to United. It was only after Sir Alex came in to stop his move to City that the doors opened up for him. After all, the owners of United, the Glazer family, are known for being greedy sheep's skates with no love for the sport to milk the club as much as they can and force players with big wages away. So, why would they show any interest in bringing over the most expensive player on the planet? In fact, at the time there were even rumors that George Mendes, Ronaldo's agent, had only approached City as a way to pressure United into making a move, so yeah, I think you see where I'm going. Regardless, to begin with, things were incredible. Even at 36 years of age, Ronaldo showed all the kids in the Premier League how it was done, with 17 goal contributions in his first 18 starts for United, and in the Champions League group stage, he was just out of this world. I mean, I think this is worthy of a little recap. So, first game in, they play young boys, Ronaldo opens the score, gets subbed off, and they waste their lead. Second game versus Villarreal, he scores a 95 minute winner. In the third game versus Atalanta, he scores with 9 minutes left to close off a 3 goal comeback. And just weeks later, in their second match against him, they go behind early, he scores in the final minute of the first half to tie the match, they go behind again, and he scores another last minute goal to tie the match again. And finally, needing a win to finish top of their group and facing Villarreal, the reigning Europa League champions who just the previous year had beat them in the final to take the trophy. Ronaldo again opens the scoring with 12 minutes left on the clock and he's subbed off with one minute to go, receiving a standing ovation. At that moment, the vibe seemed immaculate, but in reality, there was already a problem. By the time that second match versus Villarreal came around, United had already sacked their manager Ole Gunnar Solskjaer and placed Carrick as the interim. And well, even though Ronaldo had just secured their only qualification to the UCL knockout stages in a span of five years, right on his first league match in charge, Carrick benched him and ended up settling for only a draw. But even as his permanent replacement Ralf Rangnick watched from the stands as in the very next game Ronaldo scored the brace to earn them a comeback win versus Arsenal, well, I'm guessing he too couldn't learn from the mistakes of others as once he took over the squad on only his second game in charge, he benched Ronaldo against young boys once once again settling for a measly draw and nearly ruining all the hard work Ronaldo had put in to secure their place at the top of the group. Over the next month, rumors of a fractured relationship between the two would come up over and over again and as much as Ronaldo and Rangnick would repeatedly insist they maintained a cordial relationship, once he subbed him off versus Brentford, it couldn't be more evident looking at Ronaldo's body language that something was wrong and the fact he would only score one goal over the next 10 matches would confirm it. However, right after the last of those matches, he was left out of the squad against Man City supposedly thanks to an injury, but instead of sitting on the stands supporting his team, he got on a plane and flew back to Portugal. As Roy Keane would say, there seems to be something more to this Ronaldo situation. The manager insists on that hip flexor story, but come on, that man is a machine, this story just doesn't add up. 
You see, once Ronaldo was back from that trip, he seemed oddly rejuvenated, like a weight had been taken off his shoulders. I mean, on his first match back, he scored a hat-trick in a 3-2 win versus Tottenham, which many considered his best performance of the season, and just three matches later he was scoring another hat-trick. It seemed like things would finally take a turn for the better, but then, well... His wife went into labor, there were some complications, and one of his twins passed away at childbirth and the other was left struggling in a hospital. This was obviously a devastating situation, his other kids kept asking about the other baby, they had two cribs, two sets of everything waiting for them back home, his wife admitted that for a while she struggled to even leave the house, but as per usual, Ronaldo shocked the world with his relentless dedication, showing up to their match against Arsenal only 5 days after the death of his son and scoring United's only goal, dedicating it to him and proceeding to score in both of the next two matches. Even in the toughest month of his life, he was the Premier League Player of the Month, everyone was touched by these moments, even Liverpool fans applauded him. In a season where the fans turned on De Gea, where Rashford put up the worst performances of his career, where Greenwood ended up in jail, where Sancho became the biggest flop the league had seen in ages and Pogba pulled his final vanishing act, Ronaldo was named the Man United Player of the Season, earned the place in the league team of the season, finished third in the Golden Boot race and topped the league for match winners, points won, hat-tricks and Player of the Month awards. And thankfully, with new coach Tenag arriving, there was hope things would change for the better. Suddenly, there was a sense of hope floating in the air, but unfortunately, it didn't last long. By mid-July, the fans had grown increasingly frustrated with the fact the club had failed to secure any new signings, and so at Ronaldo, we informed him of his desire to leave. And from this moment on, it all got too much. He just lost his head. The media leveraged one story into a whirlwind of transfer rumors. It was Bayern, then Inter, then PSG, then Chelsea, you name it. Most of the time it took like two seconds of active critical thinking to realize that these stories made no sense. But again, with everyone hoping for his demise, who cared? Things only got worse and worse and once he missed preseason, it all exploded. Every news outlet seemed determined to convince the world that he was doing it to force his way out of the club, when in reality, it was his baby daughter who once again was in the hospital. And Ten Hag, a manager who initially seemed to love Ronaldo, a manager who repeatedly claimed that he'd love to have him in his squad even when he asked to leave, well, for some reason, he doubted him, he assumed he was lying. According to Ronaldo, the whole club did. They turned their backs on him when he needed understanding, they fired up rumors when he needed peace. And to make it all worse, Ronaldo's threats to expose all that had happened in an interview led with disagreement between him and his agent that saw their decade-long relationship come to an end making his quest to find a new club even harder and leaving Ronaldo stuck at United, where Ten Hag, desperate to assert his dominance, ended up just humiliating him, benching him repeatedly at times, subbing him on with only a handful of minutes left in the game and eventually taking it all up a notch in a match versus Tottenham, repeatedly ordering him to warm up but never actually subbing him on and then trying to force him to come in with only two minutes left on the clock, leaving Ronaldo to lash out and head towards the the tunnel before the match had even ended, being forced to train by himself as punishment. In all fairness, it's impressive how even in the middle of all this mess he still had the second most goal contributions in the team, below only Marcus Rashford, but regardless, when one month later Tenag began justifying every single one of his absences with this mysterious illness he refused to elaborate on, it became clear that things were about to burst, and suddenly the interview was announced. By now, I don't think there's much of a point going in depth about the things Ronaldo said. I mean, this interview was easily the most talked about topic in the world for weeks, but regardless, he pretty much just claimed that he felt he had been betrayed, that right from his arrival a lot of people did not want him there, that Tenag didn't respect him and that indeed the club didn't believe him when he told them his daughter was sick. But above all, he claimed that the club's infrastructures were a decade behind what he had at Juventus and Real, that there had been no investments whatsoever, attacking the Glazers once more 
more, saying that the owners don't care about Man United and referring to it as a marketing club, claiming that they had no chance of closing the gap between them and the other teams in the top six, and finally adding that if the only way for the club to progress was for him to sacrifice himself, then he would have no problem in being the first one to leave. Which became oddly prophetic when, on the very same day that it was announced that his contract had been terminated by mutual agreement, it was also announced that after years and years of protests from the fans, the Glazer family had finally agreed to put up the club for sale. However, I think it's only fair to say that in a lot of ways, this interview backfired. As always, the media machine worked extra hours trying to make Ronaldo look as bad as possible, and with the World Cup starting just two days after the termination of his contract, it all got out of hand. At one point, a clip came out of Bruno supposedly ignoring Ronaldo in the locker room, and it all got blown up into oblivion, with the media hounding Bruno until he gave them a statement. And guess what? In the end, it turned out to be nothing. If you just watched the clip with the sound on, you'd quickly realize they were just joking around. But if even once that got cleared up, it didn't matter. Every press conference was always Ronaldo, 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 no matter how many times he asked the press to stop bothering his teammates with questions about his life. And again, this got to his head. His performances seemed to get worse with each game and by the time he played South Korea, well, it was a disaster. Not only did he pretty much give a goal away, but he was involved in a couple of really embarrassing misses and 66 minutes in, the unimaginable happened. Ronaldo was subbed off in a World Cup match, and he looked completely demoralized, and of course, to make matters worse, once again, the media hemmed it all up beyond reason, using a clip where he appeared to exclaim, why is he in such a hurry to get me out, to pit him up against manager Fernando Santos, only for it to be proven that Ronaldo was actually just talking about a South Korean player who was trying to rush him off the pitch. Regardless, it didn't matter. For one reason or another, the next match was the first time in 22 years that Portugal started a knockout game without Ronaldo in the starting lineup. It was just one of the lowest moments of his career, and it was made even worse when Portugal pulled off the biggest win in their history, with Ronaldo's replacement Gonzalo Ramos pulling off a hat-trick. Even once Portugal was knocked out, it seemed nothing could take Ronaldo's name off of the headlines, and 12 days after the end of the tournament, the whole Ronaldo frenzy hit another peak. As he announced, he had reached an agreement with Al Nasser in the Saudi Pro League. At the time, this was seen as absolute rock bottom. Some criticized him over his obscene wages that would make him by far the highest paid player in the sport. Others mocked him over the fact that years back, he himself had made fun of players for moving to the Middle East. But above all, it felt like he had given up, which was just sad. However, no one could have predicted the next plot twist in this epic drama. I mean, don't get me wrong, for a while things seemed to keep on getting more embarrassing. Though there were some cool moments and though it was impressive how close he got to the top of the goal scorer's table despite only playing the last three months of the season, it was hard to make things look good since by the end of the season, Al Nasser had somehow dropped to second place and had been knocked out of every cup competition. After all, I don't think anyone really expected Ronaldo to finish the year completely trophyless and it only made it worse that United were actually doing pretty decent. Not only did they finish in the league's top three, but they even took their first title in years, even if it was only a League Cup. Sure, there were some awful moments that made it all seem okay, like their historic 7-0 defeat to Liverpool, or the fact that their Ronaldo replacement Weghorst only managed to score two goals in 31 games, but that was nowhere near enough to silence all the criticism, and even once the first of the league's big signings came in, it took a while for things to get any better. Honestly, for me, the moment I finally began doubting him, feeling like things were truly over, was after those massive preseason defeats to Infica and Salted Vigo. I just couldn't see how he could possibly come back from that. But then, well, he shocked the world. Benzema, Neymar, Mares, Firmino, Mané, Brozovic, Kanté. The massive signings came one after the other and if months back people had mocked Ronaldo for his claims that the Saudi league would become one of the most popular competitions in the world, now 
They were truly scared. Even better than only six matches into the season, he was already on six goals and had led Al Nasser to their first Arab Champions Cup title 20 years after their debut in the competition. And once the league started, he just kept dropping one incredible performance after the other. It almost seemed like every month he'd be named the best player in the league. Even in the national team, the arrival of new coach Roberto Martinez had led to his reintroduction as a team star player, leading the team to qualify to the Euros without a single defeat, much thanks to his 10 goals in 9 matches. And by New Year's, he was already on 29 goal contributions in just 18 league matches with Al Nasser, not just greatly outperforming any of the league's other marquee signings, being both the league's top scorer and top assist provider, but allowing him to total 54 goals in the calendar year. Becoming the oldest ever player to win the IFFHS World's Top Goalscorer Award ahead of the likes of Mbappe, Kane and Haaland, which was made that much better by the fact that at that point, the entire Man United squad had been involved in less league goals than Ronaldo all by himself, scoring fewer than even Lutton Town, finishing bottom of their UCL group and watching another of their Ronaldo replacements get to the 18th match day of the season without scoring a single goal. And as for Tanag, well, let's just say that at this point in the season, even David Moyes had a better record. Sometimes revenge is a dish best served cold.